Hello everyone. Welcome to our uh, webinar this afternoon on assessing and reporting. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed the, the first day back with your students and um, the beginning of what we hope is some new, uh, a transition back towards normality um, in our classrooms and, it's, and as smooth as we can make that transition. Uh, my hope that uh, there is a new normal and that we can take what is positive from the last 10 weeks and use that to engage our students and embed the skills that we will learn during this time into our classrooms. So welcome to all our members and non-members and friends um, out there. And uh, my name is Karen Bins and I am the president of ICT Educators New South Wales. And we are part of ACCE, which is the Australian Council for Computers in Education. And we are then a part of ISTE, which is the International Society for Technology and Education. So today, we're here to discuss assessment and reporting. And with me on the panel is Brian Host um, from our ICT Educators Board, and Tanya Colley from NESA, and along with him, Mark, with her, Mark Tyler from NESA as well. Sadly, uh, Penny Viles couldn't make it with us today. Um, so Mark has kindly stepped in to take her place. Uh, we have a number of board members uh, online to assist you with any questions that you might have. There is a live chat that's working alongside this stream and we have a connection so we can deal with any questions or technical hiccups that you might be happen having. So uh, we want to thank you for the questions that you submitted during the registration, registration process and um, we hope to address all of those questions um, by the time we finish this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the board um, for all their work behind the scenes and trying to work out how we were going to do this. And a special shout out to Sam Peddington, our vice president, and Helen, our secretary, um, for all the work that they've done over the past few weeks as well. Uh, I'm going to um, hand over to Brian about the procedures later about what we're going to do after this uh, webinar and the how the procedures of the secret words going to work so you can get the resource that, that we come up with. Um, so but let me first introduce you to the panel. Brian is a passionate educator for, um, and is driven by the possibilities of digital and physical technologies have for uh, his classroom practice. He's an advocate for students and teachers taking ownership in being lifelong learners that engage in their world as active citizens. Brian is a Google certified innovator, Seesaw certified educator, director of ICT New South Wales and holds a master's in educational leadership. So welcome, Brian. Thank you, Karen. Tanya Colley is the curriculum inspector, primary education at the New South Wales Education Standards Authority, as we know as NESA, where she leads curriculum development that provides for quality teaching, learning and assessment practices in the K to, for K to six across New South Wales. She's passionate about primary education and ensures that every student has the opportunity to thrive. She worked quite closely with the development of the new science and technology K-6 syllabus in her previous role as a science and technology K-6 advisor with the Department of Education. In her current role, Tanya supports schools to successfully plan, program, teach and assess student achievement across all key learning areas and encourages New South Wales schools to be innovative in their teaching and to provide that provide learning that is practical, authentic, purposeful, and student focused. And welcome, Tanya. And it's Thank been great you. to get you know, What a mouthful. <laughs> it sounds great. <laughs> so um, welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate being asked to come along and hopefully we can we can shed some light or guidance or support for uh, um, what an exciting day today was to have the kids back. Yeah, it was when we started the journey to get this webinar off the ground, we weren't expecting kids back for another few weeks yet. No. So all things change very quickly in yes. this uh, environment. Yes. And welcome to you too, Mark. Mark has been a long-time friend of ICT Educators New South Wales. And um, for those that don't know Mark, Mark is the Inspector for Technology Education for NESA and ha where he has led the development of technology education from K to 12 since 2016. Mark believes passionately that technology education is one of the most exciting areas of curriculum and vital to meeting the challenges of tomorrow. 
Mark has a breadth of knowledge across technology education, developed through a range of positions, including 20 years as a head teacher, NESA supervisor of marking, coordinating, and NESA in Indtech showcase of industrial technology, major projects. Developing teacher professional learning for the New South Wales Department of Education and the Institute of Technology Education, and is providing initial teacher education with Southern Cross University. So well done. What a career, Mark. <laughs> yeah, it seems to have gone on for a very long time. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, it's wonderful yeah. to be here. Um, and I hope, as, as Tanya said, we can sort of help uh, help teachers get a picture of what, you know, where they should be and what, what their responsibilities and um, are in the assessment and reporting space. Yes, it's a, a new new environment for a lot of teachers is coming around. So, Brian, can I hand over to you for a minute just to explain our secret word, please? Yes, certainly. So, to as part of the process of getting feedback on this webinar, we um, are going to ask our, our people who are watching um, to be able to put in a secret word. So, that secret word as part of the feedback form is going to be headphones. Um, why we why we want that is it just helps us get an understanding of who's watched and where from um, and other other potential questions that they have for for us as board. Um, additionally, if you have other questions that come up through the conversation that we we haven't been able to pick up beforehand, please put them in the chat on the YouTube channel because that then um, either our board members who are sitting on the sidelines or um, Tanya or Mark may be able to answer them directly um, because we all see that that stream of information as well. Yep. Yep, thank you. Well, to get this started, I'm going to hand over to Tanya and she's going to give us the explanation of what actually NESA does do as far as reporting and assessing. And that's been a learning curve for me and you'll be surprised what they don't do. And, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, Mark, just um, jump on in if I've left something out, out or you want to add to it. Um, I, I think what we need to do first, or first of all, is when when I have these sorts of chats, I tend to do a bit of uh, who Nessa is and what we do and don't do because I think there's a bit of confusion of um, the department and Nessa and and what the responsibilities are for both of those. Um, so Nessa sort of sits; it's still you know a, a government body, and as you know, they're the Educational Standards Authority. Um, the word authority is sometimes we question, don't we, Mark? Because we actually don't have authority in so many um, areas where your sector reps, uh, your state office reps for the sectors are the ones who have the authority because they're the ones who own your school. Um, so for the independent schools, for instance, you're independent, but there are occasions when the AIS um, as a member school might say, this is how we're going to do this as, as a sector. Um, and you're obliged um, to follow policies requirements that that either the different dioceses um, in the Catholic the sector are concerned, absolutely the department schools, and then sometimes, not so much, but sometimes the independent schools. Um, so we sit above the three sectors and we, the four pillars are probably the words that uh, that have described the areas that NESA as an organisation look after. So as we know, teacher accreditation, um, assessment as far as the, um, um, the, the HSC, ROSA, NAPLAN, um, I'm trying to think of the word to describe those assessments. So they're the... External bodies? Yes, the external, external bodies, thank you. <laughs> um, and we have um, school registration. Sorry, that's the, probably mm. the one that's on your on the front of your mind. They're the ones who come out to inspect your the schools to ensure that they're um, they're ticking their boxes and doing what they they should be doing. But just as far as the Education Act is concerned. Um, they're the ones who come and inspect you. So it's not Mark and I, we actually work in the curriculum directorate. So we're inspectors in the in the curriculum. Mark is busily developing a couple of syllabuses right now as we speak. Um, so inspectors actually project manage syllabuses in their particular area. 
Um, and up until now with the Australian curriculum, um, it's been K to 10 syllabuses to some degree, and then the electives and then stage six. So there are quite a few, especially for technologies, there are quite a few syllabuses mm. that Mark and his team have been developing. Um, and as a primary person, I have a little bit of a, an overview of the K to 10, so the primary syllabuses that are primary, and uh, and I look at the different um, support materials and resources and all the things that Nessa produces as a package with syllabuses when syllabuses are um, published. Um, but Nessa actually don't have authority over reporting, as I was saying to Karen earlier. So reporting is a national, it's a Commonwealth um, decision. It comes from the Australian Education Act um, and it's across all states and territories. And so schools are obliged as a, a through line to follow the, um, the policies, the requirements that are within that act. Some sectors, and the department is a really good example, they might add an extra layer of a policy or requirement that they want department schools to, um, to add in that space. Um, we support schools in assessment and what it might look like, what implementation of syllabuses are in the classroom or at a school level, programming, all of those things that go into the teaching and learning, um, but actual reporting decisions are not ours. Um, I don't know if that's um, if that gives a sort of an overview of how it how it happens or how it works as far as the big picture um, is concerned. And we certainly there's nothing that's mandated from Nessa that um, is aligned to assessing or reporting. I think the only thing that's mandated is that um, you need to tick your boxes for registration, and that goes with um, with just a, the quality teaching and learning and you know what's involved in all of that. Um, what is mandated that you teach from syllabuses, that we give children every opportunity to succeed regardless of who, where, what and when. Um, we support them in every possible way. And that's all in the Education Act, plain and clear. And really Nessa is the authority that ensures that the, the aspects of the Education Act are implemented and are being done to the best of school's ability. Mark, anything I've missed or you want to add in there? I think it's been very comprehensive. Um, I would just add in a little bit about the syllabuses because, I mean, I, I get calls quite regularly about what, what's happening with our syllabuses. So um, mm. I believe everybody out there would be aware that we've redeveloped new syllabuses for K to six and seven to eight. And we actually did a, a refresh of our electives in stage five. But when we came to IST, we realized that it was just too old and it needed to be a new syllabus. Um, and the same thing has happened with uh, our stage six computing syllabuses, the IPT and, and SDD, um, that they were just really, after 20 years, we needed new syllabuses. Now, in the interim, we had the curriculum review kickoff in New South Wales. So while that happened, these have been put on hold now, we, we are still hoping that they will see the light of day. We're doing, you know, final tweaks on these syllabuses uh, and all going well. You know, we hope that next year might be a year of familiarisation, but we honestly don't know until the New South Wales government makes a decision. So all the work has been done. Um, we're, we're very proud of the work that's in there and we think that they're going to meet the needs of students. We, we believe that completely, but it's just a case of for next year, because people are asking me because they're putting together their subject selection books, the, the existing exactly. syllabuses are what you will be offering next year to students. So good, good opportunity to share that with uh, such a, a wide audience. Yeah, no, thank you for that because um, we were getting some um, questions along that on, on our side as well. So yeah, yeah. thank you. Karen, can All I just right. add, I mean, Mark sort of reminded me about the curriculum review and that's probably in the back of people's minds. Because mm. the curriculum review was a, an independent review um, done by the task force and Professor Jeff Masters, um, I believe that it uh, it has gone to the time, the, the time frame that was allocated to it and everything is still happening. But because it wasn't our baby, um, we just, facilitated, I suppose, for want of a better word, 
um, but it has to go through its processes. So I have heard on the grapevine that there might be something coming in the not too distant future as far as it having gone to the minister and then back out um, for a public announcement, but we have no idea what that might look like. We All we know is what was in the interim. We've had many discussions around what that, that looks like on an operational level, but, um, but we don't have any answers around the curriculum review at the minute. So can I say so, stay from, tuned? <laughs> yes, uh, watch this space. <laughs> can I confirm from both of you? Um, I know you, you mentioned it a little bit earlier on, Tanya, but um, so the A to E then doesn't actually isn't prescribed by NESA. Is that is that is that a correct statement? Correct. Can you correct. talk that's about a that? national that's a Commonwealth um, uh, direction, I suppose, from the Act, from the Commonwealth Education Act. And um, so there's a couple of things that we've all got in our policies about you need to report twice a year. We need to report either ADE or at some five point scale. It doesn't have, need to be the letters, it can be words, it can be anything that your, your school might decide is a, an adequate way of describing five points of achievement. Um, the descriptors that um, describe what each one of those points look like come not from us but from a, a Commonwealth um, level. How, when, what that looks like, um, the fact that it's a year one to um, HSC level, um, not HSC but stage six as far as the school reports are concerned, um, it's all from the Commonwealth. Um, kindergarten doesn't have grading in that way. They have comments of, um, of achievement and, and where to. So it's really progress report. Um, there was a question that was around the reporting based on the last six weeks and the changes. I'm hoping that everyone noticed um, the published information that NESA put on their website and it was only as a, as a result of the ministers because it's a a national thing, the ministers have all decided, and that's why the announcement came from the federal education minister about some of the um, things that we need to do or have been um, made more flexible for semester one for this year. We don't need to go A to E, we can leave things off, we can um, find a way to collect the evidence that gives us some sort of indication of child or student progress for this time. Um, that ultimately comes down to the um, agency that you work in, whether it be a Catholic or a um, department school. Absolutely. That's exactly right. I think so if anyone has any questions, it's always a good idea for them to go back to their, um, their sector heads just to confirm what it is that they, they need to be putting in there. I think for some, some teachers it was that how do you compare students when you haven't seen them for the last 10 weeks? Um, exactly right. That was the tricky bit for a lot of teachers right now and how do they um, resolve that issue? Um, and yeah. I guess because that's then a sector thing, that comes down to how the school decides how to do that. Is that correct? Yes. And every school circumstances would have been different. Every, you know, neighbouring schools would have had different circumstances in what happened and how how the learning was, was delivered and, and received. Every family household has got a very different circumstance, you know, from whether they even had technology to how much input was there to support them, their age group, you know, and stage expectations of teachers. And so it's very hard to collectively um, make decisions that are valid and reliable and, and equitable, I suppose. And that's what every, every teacher just needs to know, their students and, um, try to um, think about the evidence they're able to collect and then just fill in the gaps. So the beauty of the last announcement as far as flexibility and not needing to teach everything that's in every syllabus was, you know, when they come back, whether it's one day a week or from today on, every day, have conversations with your kids, have conversations with the parents, try to work out what worked, what didn't work, try to work out not by testing, but by having these conversations and giving them some hands-on experience. What are the gaps? What do I need to put in front of them? Have them tell me about so that I can make some decisions about teaching moving forward, but where the gaps are so that I can assess, you know, correctly and, and validly. 
So, so, so one thing would be to um, make sure that you as a school and by your school principal and the executive, et cetera, are as transparent with parents as you can be because they know a lot about what's been happening at, at home for their child anyway. Absolutely. And I know that a lot of schools, uh, if they haven't already, they're doing the three-way interview with parents and, and the kids. They're talking to parents about what worked for them as, as the support person. Um, what did they notice that their child could or couldn't do, struggled with or was really engaged in, you know, what worked and what didn't as far as they're concerned. And then ask the students as well, you know, what worked for them. So try to really um, gather a lot of information and then make an informed decision from that point so that um, everyone's on the same page. And certainly communication with the community is number one to say, well, this is what we're doing because of this, or this is what we've gathered after having our three-way interviews. This is the information we have, and um, we're going to do this as far as assessing and reporting is concerned. And a number of educators would have been wanting us to do that for a very long time. Yes, yes. <laughs> to have those three-way interviews, so yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, Brian, I, I oh, not that, that That's before. okay. I, I know looking at some of the questions that have come in, um, one of the, the big things um, that a lot of people are sort of asking for are what are some suggested ways that um, we can adequately then assess based on considering we've, we haven't had the students for up to eight to ten weeks, um, how can we um, assess them to make sure that there, there is a um, appropriate assessment which can be reported on? Mark, I've been doing a lot of talking, I think. Uh... I know, and thank you for the easy ones. <laughs> um, look, it, 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 essentially, um, what we shouldn't be getting tied up in is assessing students. We should be tied up in teaching and learning. So I think um, Tanya hit, it, hit the mark there when she said, you know, what is it that students need? What support do they need? Um, what are the gaps? What have they missed out on over the last six weeks? And you know, and, and also we will learn from parents what worked from for them, what works for their child. So, um, what schools should be doing moving forward for assessment is what I guess filling in what's the missing pieces of information so that they know that as they move into the next stage of their education. That they have, there's not some building block or so, something that's going to um, perhaps um, cause a you know a deficiency in their their education. You know, if we think of something more you know lockstep like mathematics, is there something that you know it's not going to surface till the last parts of year ten that they should have learnt in year eight? Um, that that sort of thing. Um, you know. We have a responsibility to inform parents about the progress of students. You know, we, we are required to to report. Most sectors require of their teachers that they report. Um, but a lot of a lot of the last six weeks, pa parents have been watching their own students. So they, or their own children, or their students, their children, but they have a good idea of where they are and what they're doing and their levels and of reading and things like that. So they might be coming back to the to the school to say, um, I've noticed that, that my child doesn't know this stuff and I thought they might have. Um, so they will probably, I think it's it's very important to listen to the information that's coming back from the, from the parents. In terms of sort of the, the rest of the semester, it'll be a case of just um, I guess collecting what information you can, but not to test test the kids to the you know to within an inch of yes. their lives to get some numbers to put on a report because then everyone's mm. going to be happy. That's that's not what it's about. Okay? It is about making sure that we we're, we're supplying parents with useful information. Yeah, there's a number of uh, comments coming through the live chat for a huge support of those last statements that you've made, Mark. So thank you. Yeah. I was going to add just formative assessment is, is probably the most important way of mm. assessing now. So mm. it's not so much the assessment aspect, but gaining that information to work out where to next. Where am I going to need to 
um, put in front of these children so we can move forward so that there's progression. Um, and I really, that's why the conversations with parents and students are very important. And if you were putting just comments in a report for, you know, what's happened up until now, it would certainly include, you know, the evidence that's been collected or it, it seems evident that, you know, Johnny has been able to understand this because I see it in that and, and you've told me this and Johnny has done that and this is where we will be going moving forward. Mm. Yeah, good points. I think, um, sorry, I'm just gonna add one more thing, Karen, um, because I fine. feel that many teachers will will feel the need to try and cram in as much as they they can because they've missed out on all this, all this learning. Um, and I feel that this is the opportunity just to do less do it better, go into it deeper. Um, by having these conversations with their kids, they'll know what things they'll need to just focus in on. They can cherry pick bits and pieces out of syllabuses that are going to be useful to help the kids fill those gaps or move them move them on rather than, we haven't done this, this and this. That's a, this is what we had planned for in the beginning. So I'm gonna try and cram as much as I can into them because that's just not going to work for anyone. Start yeah, with the some, kids. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And some schools brought forward their third term units and um, taught them this term because they suited more the online learning and so the whole thing's been around. So it's just about collecting evidence of what they've done. I know that some okay. teachers um, that wrote to us were concerned about the parent involvement and whether parents did the works for the kids and how did you how did you discern that? And I, I think and we had the students who for those of us who teach in areas where there's a high asian um, population and a lot of those students didn't get back to our schools till mid-february in the first place yeah. um teachers away because i've only seen them for three weeks um and then we had the lockdown so they're sort of stressed over how they're going to collect that evidence and would you agree that um just go on the formative assessment tasks that you've given the students while they've been out um back it up with some um, formative assessment tasks back here in the classroom now that we've got them all back and um, work towards what you can rather than worrying about what you can't. Would that, is that a fair enough assessment? Absolutely, and have them talk about what they've learned or what they've done. And just, we know that when, when kids are explaining their learning or teaching someone else a particular concept, you know straight away whether they've understood and they've achieved that outcome or that concept which mm. is part of the outcome. I wouldn't get um, caught up in any busy work either. I would absolutely pare back what I had intended to teach and, and focus on the outcome that's going to give you um, as much information as possible. Um, and the ones that will need a lot of input or um, you don't have a lot of information, a lot of evidence on, um, leave that one for now and just, like I said, yeah. cherry pick the ones that are going to give you um, good indication of progress. Mm. Yeah. All right, I'm just looking down some, um, some of these questions that we had. Um, Brian, have you found any on your side over there? There's a lot of questions around um, projects for IST and ITT um, and how to adequately assess that. Mark, that might be something that you could comment on and what, if you were a classroom teacher at the moment, what would you do? And would the other question that came through is, if you set an assessment task um, or a task to do during the COVID lockdown, in a sense of equity, is it better to redo that assessment next semester or do we just collect a new set of data and report on that totally separately? I, I definitely think the IST area, Mark, is well qualified to do. To answer. Okay, we've got, I think I've got a Jiminy Cricket or something ha happening there. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of questions in there, but what what teachers might find is while students were not at school that in say ist for example they did more um i suppose theoretical work if you like they, they wouldn't have been interacting with it you know with hardware um with robotics things like that so it might be that that becomes a focus for the work that you do going going forward um to ensure that 
you know, students are, de are developing those skills, um, that then, you know, they've already done perhaps you know, more coding and programming exercises. They've done algorithms to, to their sort of, um, <laughs> so they're rather tired of them. They, they want to put into mm -hmm. practice what, what they have been learning and the skills they've been refining. Um, so it, it is about being agile. I mean, there was one of the questions that, that, that I saw was, you know, are, are teachers going to be more agile in the future? I think teachers have been exceptionally agile already. You know, they, they, they moved into this online, online learning space with the, a couple of days' notice. And mm -hmm. sure, you know, the, 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 a lot of teachers I spoke to were just getting really, really comfortable with it, and now the kids have gone back to school. Yeah, so, I so, agree with that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, teachers have been really, really agile in this space, but I think we need to be agile moving forward as well and working out, um, you know, what is it that students still need to learn in 2021? Because we've still got, you know, two whole terms of, of school to go for, for most, except for our perhaps our HSC groups. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of learning to be done. What's the most appropriate learning for them uh, to complement what they've been doing in, you know, the last six weeks? Um, I mean, they've already, you know, they did do most of term one. Um, so they, they got some fun foundational work there. Teachers would build on that you know, while they were working on um, online. Now it's a case to say, okay, so what is it that we didn't do that we should be doing? If we're going to match the continuum, so if we're talking about year nines, so that we have got the skills, they develop the skills for year ten, and eleven, and twelve. So it, it, it's that agility, I think. Yeah, and so they, all those practical things that you can do with all that, the information and the learning we did about around algorithms and everything that goes within that digital technologies packet is let's spend the time putting those into practical use, whether it be mm. robotics or micro bits or Arduinos or whatever. Um, but actually second semester becomes the practical component. It's just for those schools that went on, who had that rotation aspect to their um, timetables, might yep. find that a bit trickier, but I, I guess um, there's nothing you can do. You can't control that. And you've just got to go with what you know is best learning practice and best teaching practice moving forward. Mm. Yeah. We, we have the luxury of being flexible with with syllabus content and uh, mm. and what we do in in the younger years and you know up until year ten I suppose. Um, I, I think we should take advantage of that. It's going to really make us think about what what's necessary for the kids to move forward. What can I do as a teacher and you know and and not kill myself to try and and do as much as I can. As I said, cramming now, I, I think a lot of people were thinking that's what I need to do. I have to cram everything in, but it's just the opportunity to let some things go. And I think it's very important yeah. that teachers do let some things go um, and just do some things better than, or with, with a bit more depth than what they had planned to do to begin with. And that will be more meaningful. And the learning will be, you know, really um, authentic, yeah. rich, deep learning. Yeah, because the other oh, thing is necessary. We, we we need to engage students back into school. Um, yeah. that, 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 you know, I mean, it, it sounds you know, if I was fourteen years old, six weeks off school sounds like the most wonderful thing in the world. <laughs> but for many of them, it's been terrible because they've missed school so much. They've missed their friends. They've missed their routine, and we need them to get back into the routines of. You know, going to school each day, um, doing homework, you know, each evening. Um, sure. you know, just just all, all of that's very important to them. And we need to make sure that we're engaging them back in the subject. You know, it mm -hmm. could be could have been their favourite subject before they left, you know, on their, their COVID break. Um, now it's, um, you know, now it's time to get them back in into the subjects that they love and uh, get them passionate about education again. And for me, it's all about build, rebuilding our communities, whether they are our yes, robotics yes. communities or our yep. ICT educators communities. It's about how do we build, keep building community going forward and taking what was good 
out of what we've just done and not throwing the baby out with the bath water. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that we did in upskilling teachers and students um, where some of us for, for a long time are going, we should be doing this, this and this, and now we have to do this, this and this. And yeah. how do we keep what was good and, and move forward and not just leave it all yeah. behind? And then as we go yeah, forward, go not... Um, oh, I've lost my train of thought now. Not lose um, the echo, sorry. Uh, not go back into <laughs> old practices that we don't need anymore. Yeah. And, and you yeah, know, I'm... I'm I'm talking to teachers sort of all all the time. At the moment. You know, they they're ringing up and asking questions about a lot about major projects in some of our our subjects. But they're also saying, you know, I've for the first time experimented with a flipped classroom. I'm teaching food mm. technology and I've got the camera set up, and I and I'm taping my lessons. We don't want that to stop. You know, we no. we've we've sort of, you know, we've um. You know, we've made that uh, we've made that first um, big jump into this this technology world that people have mm -hmm. often said, "I'm going to do that one day. I'd love to do that one day." Now we've now we've actually they got forced into it and realizing yep. how beneficial that will be because you've got students who they miss the demonstration because they're mm -hmm. on you know uh, excursion, they're away sick, whatever. You know. Lock I think a lot of those opportunities are going to open up and this is the group that's going to support it. You know, this is the group that has those technical skills. Um, you know, with that teacher, I said, you know, head over to the computing teachers because they've got lots of cameras sitting there doing nothing because there's no students in the school. They'll set it up. And this, yep. this is where you can be, you know, absolute, you know, trendsetters um, and, and I suppose champions. Of, of technology, technology because they they've got over the first hurdle. You know, you you've kind of sold some of the advantages of technology. Most teachers are a little bit fearful of technology because when that lesson doesn't work, when the technology fails, we, you know, we've all experienced that at least once po one point in our lives. But True. they they want to get they want to become more confident with it. So mm -hmm. this is this is our chance to to um, to support them in that way. I think what you said, Karen, is right too. We, we can't slip back into our old habits. We are, we are teachers especially, you know. We do the same thing because we know it works. We need to be organised. We need to manage. We need to deliver. We're busy people. We look for shortcuts. And when we find one that works, we hang on to it, you know, with dear life. And I yes. think this disruption to our normal routine needs to be embraced and, as you say, pull out the things that have worked really well and continue doing them. And what an opportunity to get rid of things that you realised, wow, that was really taking up a lot of my time or that was stressful or that really doesn't give me a lot of indication of achievement, but this mm. does and hang on to these new practices that have worked. And, and really nice way to meld a bit of the old with the new, I think, mm. and um, yeah. an opportunity to change it up. And I think as you're saying too, Mark, we need to re-engage our kids there's nothing worse for these kids to be excited about coming back to school and going back into old habits and old routines <laughs> that they yes. weren't enjoying before. What an opportunity to really try to elicit what worked for them, what they were excited about, what what is good about what just happened and try to incorporate some of those good things into their learning, whether it be at home, and, and I'm thinking homework here because, you know, they love it so much. How can we <laughs> flip that so that they actually do enjoy it and... Um, and it might be just a little bit of a continuation or a repetition of what they've just been doing um, during this time. Mm. But I think and, that communication and, and really getting everyone to share, it takes time for people to talk and to listen, but it, you get so much valuable information from all and sundry, like I said, whether it's from parents, but especially from the kids, having those conversations with them and trying to work out a nice happy medium where you can do what you need to do, but you're also helping them become excited, engaged learners and, and progress as far as learning is concerned. Sorry, Mark. Um, no, I was just going to say, we, we also may see an increased involvement of parents in their, their children's education. I hope so. <laughs> because they, they, know, yeah. they will know a little bit more. So instead yeah. of, you know, what did you do at school today? I don't know. You know, they might actually get, you know, more than monosyllabic answers. Yeah. And... Yeah, they, they 
I guess teachers will be able to ask, sorry, parents would be able to ask the probing questions, the questions that will elicit a real response. So, you know, the, these are the positives that may come out of this because you know, there, there will be, there will be positives and we probably won't know what they are for, for a little while yet. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, the, that, that community, that relationship between the, you know, the parents, the, the kids, grandparents, whoever, um, I think that will be one of the benefits that come out of it. Yeah, I'd like to see that. And yeah, all those apps that we use to communicate with parents to keep sharing what the kids are yes. doing at school back, back yes. at home as well. Yeah. Yep. I know so Brian would be a champion of that. <laughs> Absolutely. I know that's mm. one of the questions that has um, constantly come up. Okay, we, 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 we've Brian's lost Brian frozen. in a minute, but, but I, yeah. I'll, I'll continue on his because one of the questions that I saw was, you know, name one positive. Well, and, and not, another positive that, that I've seen amongst the technology community is the sharing. Now, it's probably mm. true in, in, in other KLAs, but, but people who've never shared a resource or an idea are getting onto the forums, whether it be you know, Facebook groups or email lists. People are sharing resources like they never have before and and that Great. has been absolutely wonderful um to see i agree with that and um on that note ict educators are, are embarking on a a new way of sharing our resources and that as well so we've learned a whole heap okay. of new things um thing and, and things that we've wanted to do and i know amanda in the past has wanted to do and you know everybody's busy because you know the boards or volunteers and teaching in their own classroom mm -hmm. But this has given us an opportunity to to rethink how we might do things as well. So, so we have to learn as well. <laughs> so, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's um, some great comments in the in the chat, Karen. I'm yes. really really um, enthused with some of the things that they're, people are, are putting in there. They're, they're really said encouraging. Aren't they? about the year eleven, um, then the year twelve kids. Mark, what have you got to say for that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just I'm just trying to catch up with the chat. <laughs> oh no, no. Um, someone was saying they're more worried about the year eleven than the year twelve cohort. Yeah, and and, and look, I, I can I can understand that. I, you know, my 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 neighbour, his son is is in year eleven, and he he was saying, you know, he'd been at school for sort of eight weeks before the wheels fell off, and he's trying to learn advanced maths um, and chemistry. Now, you know, dad's an engineer, so he's done this stuff, but a long time ago, and he hasn't done calculus since first year uni. So it's, and, you know, he was saying how difficult it was for, for his son to actually develop that foundational knowledge, you know, the fundamentals of, of maths and chemistry, um, working on a remote lesson where, where we're used to as teachers sitting down next to the student and, and working through and finding where that little gap in their understanding is or mm. staring out at, at a sea of blank faces in the room, realising what you've just spent 15 minutes explaining hasn't sunk in for one of them. So you're trying explanation two and then three and whittling down the, you know, so that they all understand it by the, you know, the end of the time. That That's the hard part. And, and yes, I, I, I am worried about year 11. You know, our year 12s at least had got four terms of the HSC under their belts before, the, you know, we, we had the disruption. Year 11s have got a, a lot ahead of them. I mean, they start year 12 in, in you know, a term and a half's time. Are they ready? And, and that's yeah. where we're going to have to do a lot of thinking, soul searching about what, what is it that they need, need to know that we need to make sure that we teach a little bit like Tanya was saying, what's the essential learning that they have, have to, to go through in, so that they can actually learn the year 12 content. The year 12 content in most courses is the examinable content, but you need a certain level of understanding to be able to understand year 12, if that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, and, and the practice that we've all been, well, some people haven't because they haven't had the resources, but a lot of teachers who've already been now used to recording their lessons, let's continue to do that and just record the core teaching aspects of those lessons and, and put them up on Google Classroom or whatever the school LMS is or, 
get it out there to students so those students um, can keep refining that and going over it at home as well. I mean, we should be able to differentiate so well now because we can give access to, to students um, about what's happened in the classroom during the day and then they can show their parents who haven't done that kind of, you know, the, haven't learnt the, whether it be trading by tens or whatever or something to do with chemistry or higher end maths, the parents can say, oh, that's how they're teaching that now and, and we can take that into the future forever. So totally. um, that's what I'm, one of the things I'm hoping, so. Yeah, that, that's definitely something I, I would love to see also, Karen. Mm. We keep losing you there, Brian. Yes, um, <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on in the back ends, but uh, I'm work, trying to work on um, making sure the stream keeps operational. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful and thankful for that, so thank <laughs> you. There's some wild weather here at my outside my window. Yeah. but um, Yeah. I, I'm in I'm in the northern end of Sydney and it's uh, it's bucketing outside. So, um, yeah, well, I'm south, on. so. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's over. Everywhere. It's all over. Yeah, um, uh, and I'm not, I'm south as well, but not quite as south as where Tanya is at the moment. <laughs> True, <laughs> and it's wild and woolly down here as well, <laughs> across the board. So, Karen, are there any areas that you feel we right. haven't um, provided enough information or um, Brian, is there anything that you think we've missed? Um, I suppose one of the questions that came in, and you alluded to it, was we don't actually now need to back end the year. Um, so we can actually um, teach a little bit lighter than what we would normally. Um, I just want to confirm that because that was something that I, I noticed did come up um, in multiple streams because um, a, a couple of people sort of went, so obviously this is reporting for semester one. How will it look differently in semester two? Do we have to then completely fill semester two up? Um, that's a very good question. I know that some of the advice that, um, that Nessa published as far as the flexibility schools had, um, um, the one about um, not needing to do to teach all the outcomes and and you know choosing relative um, content and outcomes to children's needs was a 2020 advice. So the reporting advice was for semester one, and I think just keep an eye on that space to to see what happens as far as uh, reporting decisions. And and I would assume that. If everything goes back to normal now, that reporting will probably go back to normal. But the teaching to our students' needs and to circumstance and to our context uh, and the flexibility around that and not needing to start at the top of the page of a syllabus and finishing at the end of the page and using it as a checklist, that flexibility will go to the end of 2020. So I'm curious to see that now that we have a bit more flexibility, what will our reports look like? How will student achievement be affected if we can do less better, if we can choose the bits and pieces that are relevant to them or to, to our context or to the resources that we have at hand or to the expertise within the classroom, then that should make a really big difference to student achievement at the end of the day. And in reality, you're going deeper rather than just trying to cover Absolutely. all of the content. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to throw throw another one is, do, you know, we don't want to go back and, and teach in a way that is less engaging. So, um, you know, I was in a school once where one of our most experienced teachers left and he, he was probably one of the, you know, the hardest working teachers I knew. But his delivery was very dry and his resources were very old and they didn't engage students. So simply by, um, I suppose, updating what we put in front of students, we saw a significant improvement in student achievement from two new teachers who hadn't taught the course for, well, one ever, and the other one for about 15 years. So, you know, and it was about engaging kids. So we've had a, a, a really good practice go here of, trying different technologies, trying different apps and devices to, to, to work with kids, 
what worked? What, what should we keep doing with kids, even though we're teaching them in the classroom? Take, take the good from this, take the positives um, and make our teaching even better. And, and for, you know, for some teachers, um, developing, you know, lots of electronic resources and things like that, it will make their lives so much easier in the future when they're not having to redevelop every lesson because they've lost it. I know I developed something in the past. Where is it? Mm. So, you know, some of those lessons I think we need to learn from. Yeah. Or even when you're away sick as a teacher, you've got all those resources already yes. pre-filled. Yes. So, yeah. And also yeah. the ability when a, when a student's away, they can still access the learning in a continuous that's right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what Mark said. We could all, yeah. all have our YouTube channels, couldn't we, and name them after ourselves. Mm. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, there's a question here that says, "What Nessa would reckon? What would Nessa recommend we use as the basis for comparing student achievement, since this was the minister's requirement for the reports? If we are not producing A to E grade, um, that." is uh, like an underlying part of that um, that Commonwealth policy. Um, yeah. And different schools um, treat that aspect in different ways. Um, a lot of them don't don't go there unless a parent actually wants to know. And it might be a, just a very personal conversation between that parent and the principal or, or a teacher to say, you know, this is how Johnny has gone in comparison to the cohort. Um, I think it depends on what has been as far as school practice is concerned and and, um, I, and I also think that the Minister just sort of covered the aspects from the actual um, requirement so that schools didn't feel that they didn't have to do it anymore. Does that make sense? That's not something they need to publish, but it's something that they, they should provide if, if asked. If asked, yeah. If your question. Yeah, that yeah, that can be a hard one for different schools according to hard. how they do yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and all you that, can start, the question about it. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, and the only thing you could possibly start that with is with the evidence that I have at hand. I, I, you know, Johnny seems to be, and and we don't, as Mark said, we don't need numbers, we don't need percentages. You know, middle of the class, top ten percent, bottom ten percent. You know, or doing really well with support and. I did notice that there was a question about students with disability or students with learning needs, um, yeah. and nothing would be different for those students. If they're on individual learning plans, then hopefully that's what you were focusing on in preparing their work when they were working at home, learning at home, um, and that's what you would be responding to. So how did they go with, you know, how did they progress with their goals, their, their specific learning goals that's in their, in their plans? Um, we just need to make things as accessible for all our kids as possible and we're absolutely fantastic at differentiating. So it's a matter of making things um, as accessible to as many, you know, all of our kids, not as many, all of our kids in our cohort. And those two, those um, students especially is where you want to have that rich conversation with the parent and how the parent went at home. Um, mm -hmm. Having mm -hmm. a child in that, in that sector myself, it would be a really good opportunity to have some some yeah. conversations about what was the difference about what the school sees how those children learn and what the parent sees those children learn and every, both sides will have new um, insights into the way that, that those those yeah. kids learn themselves. I think um, the other question I can see around here is um, professional development around marking the HSC this year with the um, practical components of the HSC with, you know, the, the major projects and things like that. And and will there be any professional development so that teachers are, are skilled in being honest and as even as they can? Um, so I would imagine for HSC teachers that they, they could be concerned about that at the moment. Yeah. So, so this, I mean, this doesn't apply to any of our computing courses. But it, it does apply to no. um, visual arts, uh, design and technology, industrial technology, and textiles and design. Um, yes, we, we we are developing resources to to put out. 
they will be released um, later this term. I think as as everyone out there knows, if you as you're putting these things together in a short space of time, um, it, it ta well it takes time. It takes time to get them d done. Yeah. We actually uh, posted some more advice on the Nessa website today um, around the well, folios yeah. and the six minute multimedia um, video. Um, so we, we're getting out uh, added information almost as a well a continuous stream, but you know little <laughs> bits and pieces every now and then. Um, you know, we, we had advice last week that all the showcase events will go ahead. So, you know, that applies to visual arts and drama as well as our practical subjects. Um, so all more and more information is coming out. There will be professional learning for, for teachers. That will be will be coming. Um, I've had, you know, a lot of conversations with the sectors um, and with individual teachers in schools about um what that might look like. I can't actually explain what it's like, but there are, you know, it is in train. Um, uh, resources are being developed as we speak. Well, maybe they've gone home for the day, but you know, we're we're working we're working on those because it is there's quite a lot of subjects that we're talking about. Um, so yeah, it's it's on the way. Professional learning will will be available. Um, you just have to be a little bit more patient. I'm afraid. Yeah. And, and then, uh, we've got extra uh, time to hand those in anyway now, don't they? Yeah, yes, yeah. they do. It's so, not being a HSE teacher, sorry. So yeah. that's why well, uh, you're, you're doing on. very well. Yeah, so, so <laughs> it's been allowed extra time, um, an yeah. extra two weeks to, to finish off, you know, let's, let's hope to finish them off. Um, mm. And the, you know, the advice was there today about you know, a hand-in date for the folios and when marks are due to Nessa. So there is more and more information um, coming out. There were quite a few questions at one point about um, are they going to need to be an online submission? Well, the answer is no. It's just going to be the traditional printed folios um, that will be submitted to NESA. In subjects like textiles and design, they also include samples of, of um, testing inside the yes, folios. Yeah. So you really need to submit that. Um, and for our other courses, Often we've got a lot of drawings and things like that that you know are difficult to scan to and get a really good quality image. Um, but you know we also don't want to change things too much for our students. You know they're also stressed um, and vulnerable. So the more we can keep the same, the better for them um, yeah. and the teachers just quietly. But um, for, for, our, for our our kids. <laughs> Our kids are they, they're very very stressed through through these major projects and when you think that about twenty thousand students do a major you know so that's you know roughly one in four students does a major project so there's a you know it, it is a, a very um, a, pet, a potentially big stressor in their um, in their education and I did see that you put out a call out for markers for that for early term for today oh, yes. as well yeah, on that same you. release. So, <laughs> so I, I put it out as a tweet, but I also contacted um, two of our uh, other associations today to say that mm. um, because it's changed the nature, because it's not itinerant marking for DNT and industrial technology. So yeah. it, it will be corporate marking in a marking centre of of the folios. Of the folios, so, yeah. Yeah, and and that's that's going to open up some opportunities for some teachers who. Um, may not have been able to get out of their school to go marking, but they can come and be part of this corporate marking, which is you know weeknights and Saturdays, um, uh, all of it in the marking centre. So it's none of it is uh, marking at home. Um, but but equally, we may have some people who were country markers who may not be able to 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 do that anymore because they're not being released from their school like they would through a normal itinerant operation. So all all of that information is there on markers online. If people would like to to go in and, and, and log in, if you're a new marker, uh, there's just a link there to create a, a login for you, um, and I believe it's a, it's an immediate um, creation. So um, please go in and um, and have a look. I'll quickly jump in um, just um, because we only have just under five minutes left. Um, I just yeah. want to remind people for the. Um, the feedback form, uh, the key word, the secret word is headphones. Um, and then I'll pass over to Karen just 
um, for any closings. Um, same with Mark and Tanya, if you, you have any closings, because I can, um, I definitely respect the time and we want to make sure we yeah. um, finish up close to the time. Um, Fiona just has a, a, a question in the chat that um, we might be able to respond to just by text and we can, so what we're hoping to do is put some of the answers from from this webinar plus a recording of the webinar. Um, it'll be attached to that resources thing. So headphones is an important word, so you get all of that. And Tanya gratefully uh, gave me some links to different things for assessment and thing um, and ideas for assessments. Uh, last week that will also be included in the resources that you get after this webinar after the feedback form comes in and um, And if we've missed a question I can always email Tanya and Mark and they're very kindly will answer it if they can uh, in the In the restrictions that they have um, So um, yeah, so Tanya and Mark do you got any final words? One quick question that did come in, Mark. How do you apply for it to be a HSC marker? Because that was something that had come through. So, so um, what I'll do is I'll send send the link through to Karen. I'll I'll, I'll retweet it for those people who, who follow my tweeting account. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll send I'll send yeah. There's a hint. I'll send it through to Karen. Um, it you marked you access it through markers online so even if you just google markers online that will take you to the page um, and if you have marked before you will have a login um, if you are a new marker you just click on the link and it'll create create the login um, there was a question there also from um, saying isn't it too late to apply for marking well not for those um, those three courses so for textiles and design industrial technology um, and design and technology for the we, we're calling it the practical but it's actually the marking of the folios so that um that is being opened up again um for for applicants because of it because it has changed from an itinerant marking operation to a corporate marking operation and in awards um the questions come through are we pursuing those still for kids that haven't demonstrated or engaged in the outcomes of what whichever ones we pick. Look, it, it that's good. You know, that's a tricky one because it's going to be you know a fairly you're going to have to tread fairly carefully in in your school. I did have a call for somebody this week where um, a student had missed three opportunities to do a task. Now, mm. they as as they offered more and more opportunities for for the ones who'd missed. Um, there, there was one who just wouldn't engage. Now, whether that's enough to, to trigger a, an N award, I'm not sure. I don't know enough details. But I think we need to be, you know, fairly understanding of, of student circumstances. This is not, you know, it hasn't been a normal time by any stretch of the imagination. So, I mean, I would be looking for how do we support these kids before we look for how do we punish before that. Them. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes, I would agree with that. But sometimes it, it is necessary. It really does. Mm. It's a case by case basis. Yeah. Tanya? I have no other questions. I just want to say thank you. And if, you know, we think about things and come up with questions post, I'm more than happy to um, help anyone who have specific, who thought of specific questions post tonight. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, I want to thank you yeah. both for. Being, being great and I can certainly attest to the fact that these Mark and Tanya are not scary people to talk to and they're quite <laughs> friendly and they will answer your questions so uh, be assured we, of that. Um, we try. Brian, did you, <laughs> Brian, do you have anything? Um, no, I, it's just been really good to hear straight from you guys um, because there's, being, being in the environment we're in, there's a lot of miscommunication so mm. it's really good to hear directly from Nessa what their expectations are and um, how we as educators in the classroom can have that outwork. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. the uh, for the chance to support. That, that's our bread and butter. That's what we love to do the most. Um, and if we can help anyone at all, it, it helps us to sort of get our job done. Um, but I wanted to say too that Although it's great to hear from Nessa and uh, and it puts things into perspective because a lot of people, you know, as I said at the very beginning, are a bit confused about the roles. 
always check in on your sector reps because yeah. as i said expect um, nessa has like a minimal expectations and then the other sectors may have a, a little bit more added on to that so it's very important that you are always in touch with what your sector um check in. And yeah. might need to do. and can i just sort of say a thank you to the association because you guys do a, an awesome job for your members um you know you you're you are so dynamic um, I've been to you know a number of your your teach meets and um, events you know over the years. Um, you know you you fill a very very important um, space in the you know I suppose the the professional learning of your of your members. Mm. Um, and while I'm at it, congratulations to Karen for um, taking over as president <laughs> of the the association. I wish you well. It it was an interesting time to to do that in we had our agm the weekend before yeah. lockdown and yeah. it's been a learning curve ever since but can i just say thank you to the past executive of our board um because um they've been fantastic as well so amanda and emma and um but the current board um which amanda and emma are still on by the way um have been fantastic that everybody's sort of pitching in and, and helping out so so yeah so thank you and thank you to everyone out there that's uh listened and watched today um we have a number of webinars if you go to our website that we're planning to to run um, we have one next monday um that's going to be presented by the apple education team and it's on let me just get the right title create and share your presentations and demos so it's really to back up what we've been learning in COVID as far as how to create those great online videos and demonstrations for our students and what, how we can use um, use those skills going forward. So they're going to look at Keynote and lots of other different presentation type tools um, that you can use to do that with. Um, we're going to have some, uh, we've got some webinars with Microsoft and Google and lots of great teachers who are willing to put their hand up and, and do some webinars some of them will be pre-recorded and some of them will be live so we've got things on um Thunkable and wonder workshop and dash and heaps of things coming an example so, right? we released on wednesday there will be a seesaw um webinar training session released by two of my teachers um on wednesday yeah so we got some good things. Um, also on our website, you'll find DLTV, which is the Victorian version of us. Um, they've got some great webinars coming up that they've given us free access to as well. So lots of things. Uh, webinars is one of the, the the new diet parts of my diet online at the moment, but um, it's been great. And um, thank you, Brian, for doing the back end of this. Thank you to the board who are on the back end of the um, the chat and helping out there. and especially to Helen and Samantha for all the work that you've done in the lead up to this and the rest of the board as well. So thank you and good night. Stay safe and um, enjoy your students um, for the next <laughs> little while <laughs> until the holidays come. So thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.